my God. I think here we go. Okay, Good. we're on now. Hello. Hi, Sabin. Hi, Mark. How are you? Wonderful. Good. All right, that took a minute, but we got there, huh? Yeah, look, nudes. So, um, <laughs> as you can see, Sabin's at his studio in uh, New Jersey, and there's some of the beautiful pieces of, of his collection in the background. And um, so, Sabin, what was it um, that inspired you to be a sculptor, an artist? What was it? Was there something at an early age that um, oh, ignited this spark in you? Uh, well, it's, I was on the path to failure, so it was a, a good <laughs> thing that I found something. <laughs> and it seemed to work? Yes, it worked. I, uh, the moment I, I went with my parents, who were both teachers, they dragged me into the Met Chapel in Florence, and um, so that was that was a moment where I was doing woodworking, and I was 14, and I was impressed with the stonework there, and I noticed the sculptures, and it, it kind of was a catalyst, it was a spark that gave me the idea that I could make something um, like what had happened in the Renaissance. And why classicism as opposed to something abstract or contemporary? What was it that um, that was so passionate with you about classicism? I, you know, it's like if you grow up in Italy, there isn't much else but that. So okay. I, I was like, oh, that's what art looks like, so I, that's what I should be making. <laughs> well, you know, it's... Um, I had the same reaction when I saw classical art. It had the same impact on me and I think that's what one of the things that drew us together so I know you're tired of the story but I'd like to just briefly tell how we met oh, so yeah. Yeah. I think it was probably around 13 14 years ago Sabin came into my office and it was one of those weeks I was very busy and was just too busy to talk to anybody and so he came in and I thought to myself okay I'll give him 20 minutes and then I'm out of here and he walked in my office carrying something in his hand and he had a, a cloth over it. And um, he started talking and a few minutes into the conversation, I said, you know, I haven't heard a word you're saying. I just am looking at what you're holding in your hand. Are you gonna let me see it? So he took the cloth off this piece of bronze sculpture <laughs> right. and at that moment, our relationship changed and I think we became dear friends from that moment on. Yes. I knew what I could see what was in your heart and your soul from that piece. And it just really blew me away, Saban. I was Thank just so moved by it. And all I could think was, I don't want him to leave with this piece of sculpture. I want it. I want to see it every day. And, and I actually, I, I do have it today. <laughs> wow. And so, um, but we sat and we talked for probably two hours after that. Yeah. And we talked about travel, about um, Italy, the influence of art in our lives. And, and I don't know that I've ever met anybody as passionate about what they do with such strong conviction as, as you. Thank you. Um, so um, what I was going to ask you with classicism, um, you don't have the same reaction when you're looking at contemporary works of art. You're just not, um, it's not the way you see the world. No, um, it seriously has a lot to do with like growing up in Italy. I mean, I was born in New York and then we went to Italy until I was three. And then I, you know, you come back to New York and you're, it's like the sixties and the sixties was the way that you were supposed to, if you didn't think outside the box, you weren't thinking. And so if that was that was kind of like the platform that I, mm -hmm. I that I that I came out of. Mm -hmm. Think outside the box. What's the what, what did you get like planted in your head when you were just a little child? And that that that's all I knew art was. I thought it was Raphael, Leonardo, and Michelangelo, and I had no idea that there was de Kooning and all these other people called. Them. That was foreign to me. It still is slightly foreign. <laughs> well, if if you didn't feel so strongly about it, you probably would have changed direction somewhere yeah. during your career, you know? Yeah. And you know I'm really stubborn, and it's like, you know... Yes, I'm you're very stubborn. Bullheaded, <laughs> and it's like, I'm going to do my thing, and it's my vision, and it's like... And, 
it, it, you need that in today's no. world. You really do. You need to yes. have a clear idea of where you want to go. Right. So, Sabin, let's talk about um, a soldier's journey because oh, fine, this is yeah. such an important piece of work and I'm so proud of you for you. Um, being awarded this commission. This is a historical piece of sculpture that you're creating. It's part of world history. And Sabin was awarded the commission for the World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. And this is a work that you've been working on for what? Five years now? Yeah, well, you know, it, st it, came, it started in 2015. You go through a, a massive process to get to the actual studio. So you spent right. four years before you get here. Right. And you've been dealing with numerous government agencies and commissions. Five. And Five agencies and a client. Right. So that's got to be very trying as an artist because you have a vision. Yeah. And I, I'm certain that you have people on the commission that think they know better than you. And as you say, you have to have conviction because otherwise your work becomes watered down and it's not true to what you're trying to convey. Well, I'm really lucky because I have a methodology. So things aren't only done like from my heart, but they're also done on an intellectual platform of how to structure projects out and how to actually go about making a figure. So I have 50,000 hours of working with life models prior to this and then that coupled with my education, it gave me a clarity and you jump into this like viper's pit and, they, and, and you have a thousand people coming at you saying, do this, do that, put a horse, put like uh, airplanes in, um, put barbed wire in. And so you, all of a sudden your head's spinning and so like one day I go to the bathroom and there on the wall is the last judgment poster, Michelangelo's poster from the Sistine Chapel and I was like, do what you know. And the, the last judgment is everybody meets his maker at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. that, was, that, that kind of got me back to the path. Oh, that's great. So um, can you tell us a little bit about yeah. um, a soldier's journey? Because it's a, I think it's a, a brilliant story. It's very moving. I'll move so very tell us how, how you started this and what the story is. I'm going to walk across my studio. I have a very, I'm going to turn around. I have a very big studio right now with skylights and we're going to walk over to um, the drawing. So I started with the drawing. Is the picture okay, Mark? Yes, yeah, great. Okay, so sorry, I haven't really cleaned up much, but behind here we did a drawing and the drawing, that was, that drawing started things off and from that drawing then I had to make a model and the model that I first made, I made in New Zealand. And there's a story here. And then from there, we went to the final piece, which is across the... Well, these are seven-foot figures. I'm going to take you now to the five-foot maquette and just run you through in 30 seconds the story. So I made a story of a man who begins with his family... Can you see that? Yes. I'll just run down and then he's there with his wife and daughter and then he leaves he leaves his wife and joins the Brotherhood of Arms and then he enters into battle and then there he is leading the charge in the middle Then after that is the cost of war and then there he is in the middle the shell-shocked or thousand-yard stare and that's a transformational piece of that man. Mm -hmm. And then this is the return home, and here he is at the very end. He hands his daughter the helmet, and she's the next generation. So this is an allegory for America, the change that the United States went through, and it's also a mythological story. So you have three stories. Family, mythological, which is a hero's journey, like Joseph Campbell and the allegory of the United States that was transformed by this, you know, global epidemic of war. Yeah, I know that um, um, World War One is sometimes referred to as the Forgotten War. Yeah, it's usurped by the Roaring Twenties and um, the Great Depression. So uh -huh. it's on the map because 
it ends in 1918, um, and, and that you, you go into a depression, and then there's money to make appointments. And so this didn't get commissioned and put into effect till um, 2015, when um, Buckles, the last World War I, um, I guess, veteran, died. I think he was over 100 years old, and that's when they began the idea. Well, it's, it's a wonderful tribute. So, Thank you. Um, let me see here. Um, you know, how do you stay true to your conviction? Because I've been through this process with you um, and talking with you along the way, and I know that people, um, like you say, want to add um, their little bits of emotion and feeling to this piece. But like any work of art, not just this one, but your other works, how do you stay focused on what what you're doing and not not move into another direction with it? Um, I, you know, that's a really hard question because I don't know any other way of being. That might be a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Like, well, it's true. I'm not, you know, knowing you, I guess I answered the question because knowing you, um, you, <laughs> you have a focus and you just go for it. Yeah, I kind of get in your heart. You know what's right. I'm not ADHD. I'm the I'm compulsive, so I get stuck right. on something, okay. and it's like <laughs> if it pull, put the bone in its mouth, and it won't let go. And it's like you can't get the bone out of my mouth, no matter what. So it's like you know, it, it's you know, it, it, the, the the positive thing is it's a force of nature. But on the that's the good part that you're going to get things done. And then there's this obsessive quality of like that's it, all that you think about, and, mm. and it's difficult on the people around you because you're so fixated on your on your your task. Mm. So how was it that you decided on a wall as the um, as the vehicle to express what you were doing as opposed to maybe a um, a monument with architecture and so forth in it? What how did you arrive at this? Well, the, the, you know, I, look, I thought in my head, what is the one thing that is that everybody understands in terms of art and they love in film? And so film has become the number one art form of our times. So I'm here, I'm, here, I'm a sculptor, right? And I need to make something that will last forever and is not ethereal. Uh, so bronze outlives us, every, everyone. It lasts forever. So I came up with a concept where to make a sculpture, but it, it is created in a film format where you walk along it and the scene change. If you're an active participant and mm -hmm. you walk because you're active, you see five different acts. And these acts are the equivalent of what a story would be on, on, on a screen. But they're three-dimensional and they're made in bronze. So my project is uh, a bronze film, almost. And what, what did you do to authenticate uh, this and the figures that you're sculpting? What did you well, reference? Well, uh, well, the the way that I worked here, and I'll, I'll show you. This is I used real people. So if we go look over here, look in the background. That's Zach, and Zach is one of our models. Zach is been working with me for since 2016, Zach, is yeah. that right? And uh, that's David over there, he's hiding. <laughs> um, he's one of my sculptors. So um, the models are my impetus, they're my catalyst, so, and they dress in, let's go over to Zach and I can show you. So Zach, you, yeah. he's wearing an actual jacket that's on combat that's a hundred years old and so then he poses and we'll show you because David's going back to work at lunch Can you hop up and show this? why don't we show how we work so this is the figure that Zach that David is sculpting and David's going to then arrange Zach's uniform in a way that becomes then a reference for the calling figure in the foreground. David, you're not in the picture, so don't worry. So there he's arranging the drapery, and then he, David can sculpt from that. So our sculptures are not generic 
they are driven by human feelings and emotions. And my concept was work from a live reference. A live reference will give you a lot of drama and a lot of visceral feeling. So if I do that in my studio, and then you put this monument in a location where you have 5,000 visitors a day, I'm going to transfer my feelings into the art, and then the visitor will see the art, and that same visceral reaction will be had by somebody visiting a World War I memorial. Instead of thinking, oh, this was something that was done 100 years ago, who cares? It's a forgotten war. No, this is a this is an art object, this wall, that is pertinent today because it's done with real people today. Yeah, and the figures that you've used in here, are they models? Is there anybody in particular that you used as a model for this? How did you go about selecting what what models you wanted for this project? The, the models are, that I used are, um, they, well, uh, you know, right, I used my daughter. I used, uh, I'm using an Asian, I'm using an African American, I'm using a Cherokee, I'm using a Jewish man, um, out there. Zach is Italian. Uh, Paul, the, the father figure, is French. Um, Evelyn is... What is Evelyn? Uh, Latvian. Latvian. The woman is Latvian. So this is a melting pot that is us. It's the United States. So yes. my, model, my models are not the generic, you know, let's, let's just call it the, the L.A. Um, film star if they don't look like film stars they look like real people real people yeah and so and they're from every range of our society and so you, you're you're not pegging the american because that doesn't exist it's the american is right on and that's what the models are yeah well one of the things that you've definitely captured and, and you can see a little bit of it here but um, yeah, is, is emotion and the passion and the angst and um, terror um, it it's so expressive um, the movement of the figures and when you do this this is an assembly of many different figures into one piece is that right yeah that's right and you, we you do them individually and then yeah, we see the frames that they're on like I'll go around, you can see, is that too fast? That, no, that, no, it's good. That frame then allows me to take each of the figures and prop it up and we can take it to our modeling stand. And then that then gets put back on the wall. Here's the wall. This is what's coming. This is a digital, this is our armature that's digital, that's what we get. So, See, those are assembled on the wall. So that brings up a good point. So how has art in the digital age um, entered the artist studio today? And, and um, was there an advantage to technology and, and the digital age assist you in this? It's incredible. It's the digital technology is terrible. So I'm not... I'm, I want to just say I'm very, very traditional with the 50,000 hours of sculpting, the drawings, and, and learning how to do this in, in Europe and Rome. I'm your, you know, if Wikipedia, Wikipedia has a picture for traditional artists, my photo is right next to it. And so, but the digital, I could do a project that would have taken me my lifetime in four years. That's incredible because it's Speeds up the grunt. So what we did is we took our five foot, the five foot version that I put together manually, and then we enlarged it to this, which is this is all digital, and the digital is it's basically um I use it as an armature. So to me, this is this is not art. This is um, spatially correct. Uh, if we look, can you look down the wall? That's the little model enlarged. I think it's enlarged by six times. And then I take that and we cut the hell out of it. Look, it's like, I'm going to show you a leg in the back. So we take the foam and we just chop, chop it. See? We chop the back and cut it, 
and we sculpt directly on that with the live models. And that's what makes now is is, is is that um, is that maquette in these figures? Are they clay? Are they resin? What is the medium? The 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 the, the foam that I've sculpted on top of this it, uh -huh. is it's foam. It's milled in a CNC machine, and then on top of it, it has a skin of clay, and then we take that and we go to town on it and start cut it even more. And then we, I, you start to sculpt. And if you look, I want to show you the texture. I'll go real close so you can see. Do you see the texture? It's traditionally yeah. modeled. So here's right. that. And so then we're going, we, we're doing what was done 500 years ago with the tech, using the technology as the underlying basis. But you couldn't pull this project off unless you were trained traditionally. Because you have to have the compass, the compass of where you're going. But it's so never, it's what do you think, this whole process and the several years you've been working and you've still got, how long till you complete this project, do you think? Well, we, we do, on my contract, I did a, a timeline. I had to do it online. Everything is very structured in terms of, right. this is, mm -hmm. there's not like, okay, just start and then let's finish around. You no, know, it's like we finish on a specific date and I, Tracy's my project manager and we went through massive, um, period getting this all together in terms of how we do it, how long it takes and the process. Mm -hmm. So I found a foundry in Pang which is Pangolin, which is in the UK in the Cotswolds. And we decided that was a really, really sharp place to go because they had aesthetics and craftsmanship. And, um, it was a foundry that Damien Hurst was the, you know, he's on the other end of the spectrum for an artist used but they can take these massive projects on. And so we, we decided to use them as the assistance in the fabrication and the casting of this in bronze. Wow. So what do you think's the, been the most challenging aspect of this whole project? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I dare say it, it's the of Washington, D.C. Oops. <laughs> well, you know. I, I, I guess uh, anybody could have answered that question. Really, so, trying. It's very trying for just a creative yeah. person. Yeah, it's very, very trying. Because imagine if, if uh, like you said in the beginning, if you had a, you were sat in a room with uh, bureaucrats and lawyers, and they were the ones dictating where the project could go. But what happened was, because of my stubbornness, I refused to, to follow, and I the leader of the art project, and um, I brought my skills to the table, and they brought their skills to the table, and we merged, and this is the result. Well, I'm certainly pleased that they had the wisdom to see that, um, to see your conviction and, and understand that this was the way to go. Well, there wasn't so, much. <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, and also it's great to be in the studio with you and see this because you can talk about something like this and, you know, it's you're talking about it in the abstract. To actually see this, um, this is, a, is an historical piece and we're seeing it develop. It's a very yeah. exciting process. Yeah. And understanding how all this works, I think very few people get to see the process, how something is created, how your mind um, comes up with a vision and how you execute this. So um, I think this is very special. Thank you. Um, you know, there's, um, for those of you who are interested, if you go to Sa Sabin's website, um, sabinhoward.com, there's several videos on there, and there's one called A Soldier's Journey, and it's particularly interesting. It'll take you through the entire project and and the story in detail. And it's a it's a really great video, Sabin. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Really kind so, of you. Right. so you know, I know the stress you're under with this. There's a you know tremendous amount of pressure and and get yourself and to stay focused on um, your vision here. What do you do to relax? I, uh, well, I, I, I'm an avid cyclist and I, um, like to work, 
George Washington Bridge from New York to Englewood, New Jersey, and I ride on the weekends. And I have actually a really, really great um, partner that I um, walk with and a great daughter. So between my family and my biking and my um, cooking and being outdoors, I have a balance in this project that I have never had before because uh, four years full on, you need to take the weekends off. And normally I would work through weekends. Now I don't work weekends anymore. We're really hard during the week. And I think that's the best thing. Well, I, I know that you just moved out of New York and you have a wonderful place in the country. You're surrounded by nature. beautiful nature. Yeah. And yeah. I know uh, it's the same for me. To I find it very healing and I find it necessary to get myself focused so that I can stay on track with what I'm doing too, so. Yeah, um, it's yeah. It, it's your place of recovery. That's what I like. Right. And it's also great that you have um, your wife and your daughter who are very supportive and very proud of you. Yeah. Um, and I know that means a lot. Yeah, Tracy's really, I, look, uh, my wife is my project manager and she's excellent at it. I mean, it's, I, I couldn't afford her if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Like she's just really structured the project out well, and you need that as a as a creative to have a back office that really keeps all that in line. It, it's yes, it's so huge in the business, and I'm not your typical artist where it's just like oh, I'm just gonna go out and create something today. It's it's I run a business, and this is a business, and making yes. this level is a business, but it, you have to learn. Onto your vision and your soul in, in that process. So, Sabin, beyond this piece, when it's completed in the next few years, yeah. um, where do you see moving next? What What is the next step well, for you? The, the vision that I had, and, and I want to. This is something that my my dharma. This is what my life um, is. This is what I'm supposed to do with the energy of my life force energy. It's to create a, a change in the direction that art history is moving so that art moves towards a representation of spirit or who we are as human beings rather than following the almighty dollar. So it's, to me, it is very important to create something that is sacred and return to the ideology that art is sacred. And so I'm doing that at the largest scale that I can do and the project that will follow this, um, I would say would be even larger than what I think will come. Great. Well, uh, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see um, this placed in its um, permanent yeah. home and yeah. for the world to view it. And um, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to share this with us. Um, well, it's so thanks special. For that, Mark. Thank you. What? Thank you for asking. Oh well, you know, great. You know, I'm I'm your greatest admirer, other than your wife and your daughter, Saban. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. I'll all right. Find all right. Bye bye. Okay.